good morning everyone. I do apologize for my voice, a um, little bit sick, and uh, I think we'll start a little bit and wait until Professor Balk is here. Um, for the beginning, uh, today's lecture will be about optimization, and it's basically a step further to what we did last week, which was indexes. And um, uh, the idea is, at one point, yes, you will have uh, big data and you can use indexes on top of the data as a handle uh, for efficient access to the data. However, at one point, um, during the lifetime of your data mm -hmm. warehouse, the data will grow uh, substantially in size and um, mm -hmm. probably indexes, uh, even though they are quite clever to use, uh, at one point, they won't be the most efficient thing. So what did we do last time? Well, last time we looked at multidimensional data. And uh, for that, we looked at R trees. And R trees, uh, we looked at the geometrical uh, constructions that we use, so minimum bounding rectangle. The most two uh, problematic things were dead space and overlap. And uh, other variations of the R tree tried to balance this uh, trade-off between these two problems. Um, <clears throat> and second, we looked at UB trees, and this was uh, basically an, a way to reduce multidimensional data to single dimensional data, and you reduce that by fitting the points into space, whether it is a Z curve in case of the UB tree or a piano curve, uh, whatever the methodology is. And lastly, we looked at bitmap indices, which were specifically designed for data warehousing, and they were very efficient because they, at the end of the day, they go down into bitmap, uh, into bit operations and bit interleaving. Um, today, like I said, we continue with optimization, which is a step further. So, optimization is a topic that is not only interested in terms of the, um, uh, the uh, indexes that are concerned, but also in terms of um, how the data is actually stored in the data warehouse, right? And uh, this is the area of partitioning. And we'll talk about different partitioning schemes that make it easier to access the data and that make it faster to access the data. Uh, we will talk about joins. And we will talk about materialized views, uh, which is one of the, the main things that the data warehouse uh, gets its performance from, right? Because um, uh, all these data operations use a lot of um, uh, different um, aggregates and having these aggregates um, materialized already before you, you, you uh, pose the query is of course a big help as opposed to um, uh, calculating it on the fly. Okay, uh -huh. I have to. Ah, what's happening? Zit, zit, okay. Careful. So, um, the idea of partitioning is that you don't store all the data in one big lump in some space, right? But that you partition it in different smaller units, and each of these units is physically stored somewhere, right? And you can handle these units and access these units separately, right? And if you do that in the right way, um, you get a very efficient implementation of a warehouse because consider you have to do a linear scan over a table happens very often for example for data mining topics right um, there's a big difference whether you have to scan terabytes and terabytes of data because it's all in one file or you know okay the data of 2012 that I need is stored in this couple of gigabytes file right and I just scan that so this is this is the idea um, so the question in data warehousing is, is not really whether you partition. It's only how you do it, because you are going to partition your data. Nobody is going to put all that data in one single box and that's it, right? Um, this is not going to work. So, 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 why doesn't it work? Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. 
Okay. So the question is, um, why do we need uh, partitioning, right? Um, what we want is, is a certain flexibility in managing your data um, because the smaller the blocks are that you store, the better you can address the changes in the data, right? For example, uh, think about indexing. If you rebuild indexes, which you have to do, R trees, for example, from time to time you need to rebalance the structure, right? And uh, if, if you uh, insert a new data, uh, you need to rebuild the index tree. If all the old data is still in the same file, then the newer data, and think about warehousing, you're only appending data usually, right? Then when building R trees, you have to re-index all that old data. Well, a lot of wasted effort because it's going to fall in the same areas anyway, right? Um, sequential scans, just talked about it, right? Um, sometimes you have to reorganize data. You, you stored it in a certain linearized fashion. Uh, think about how we uh, physically implemented warehouses, right? Linearization was one of the topics uh, that we had. Um, so you decide at some point, well, there tend to be more queries of a certain kind, so another kind of linearization would be much more efficient for sequential reading, right? If it's all one big block, reorganizing that, very bad. Uh, you might also have problems with, okay, a certain kind of query occurs for different types of data, right? So the older data is usually um, uh, queried with a lot of aggregations, right? The newer data is, is, is also queried with point queries or kind of transactional queries. Then storing them in different linearizations is possible only if you um, partition the data, right? And of course you, would know, uh, you want to know uh, what's going on in your data. This is kind of annoying today. Okay, good. So, <coughs> when you do the partitioning, what you want to do is first query performance, of course, you want to uh, minimize the amount of data to scan, uh, but it's also a problem of data availability. For example, um, old data needs to be in the data warehouse, but queries uh, tend to be, especially if you do trend channels, if you do uh, regression analysis and, and, and want to do a certain amount of prediction, uh, that is usually done on, on newer data, right? So having more copies of the newer data for different applications to work on uh, is a sensible thing. So uh, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, the replication, in terms of backups and restoring, um, that's, that's a sensible thing. Um, and also if you want to change parts of the schema, having partitions that show some aspects of the data and maybe not even recognize, uh, reorganizing the old data, but, but adding a new partition with, with new information, new columns, for example, right, um, that you need, uh, might be a good idea, right, without touching the old data. So that's kind of a sensible thing. Um, there are different ways of partitioning um, on, on a very high level. There's the data partitioning where you kind of like structure the data in a certain form uh, that the data belonging together is in the same partition. And on the other hand, there's the, um, well, basically environment-driven partitioning, hardware partitioning, right? Where you have to look at the hardware, what you have, and, and, and uh, fit the data best to, to the environment that is there. If we're talking about data partitioning, uh, the data is usually partitioned by uh, some of the dimensions that you have. For example, by the dates, by different lines of businesses in different partitions, geography, right? The European data is separated from the uh, American data uh, because you very uh, rarely do joints about them both, but you both index them and, and, and mine them in depth because you want to know um, how Europe is evolving or how, how uh, the Americas are evolving, right? Um, same goes for organizational units. Think about uh, big organizations like, like Volkswagen uh, that uh, tend to have different, uh, different brands, right? like the Skoda and the Audi and uh, uh, whatever, right? 
um, and uh, those different organizational units might care for different things, so you want to partition the data. And of course, all combinations of these uh, can, can be done. Um, hardware partitioning is kind of like um, uh, uh, um, uh, rather concerned with the environment that you have. Your environment has a certain strength, right? It has a certain um, uh, volume. Um, and especially if you do data mining, you will find out uh, that you need both, that you don't only need a good management system, a database management system or data warehousing system uh, that runs efficiently and has a lot of storage and fast storage. Um, uh, but that you also need a lot of uh, computing power, that you also need a lot of CPU power. Uh, when we go into the second part uh, of the lecture in the data mining, you will see some of the algorithms and uh, you will notice that they need consequent scans over the data all the time, right? And, and they're, uh, they're working with the data. So um, uh, some of these sub-processes, especially the mining processes, might run on specialized nodes only, right? Otherwise, it will take you years to mine something sensible out of the data. And this is something that you have to look at. OK. Um, data partitioning. Uh, works on different levels. So there's the application level and there's the um, uh, basically the database uh, level. Um, of course, on the database management system level, it's, it's, it's kind of obvious um, uh, to do it. But uh, think about data marts. Think about uh, special uh, data collections for a specific purpose. Uh, so it, it, it's really sensible to also look at partitioning on application level and look at how different departments are faring and, 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 and so on. Um, also uh, looking at uh, what operations might be sensible, uh, for example, for newer data only, right? I, I, I probably don't need trend channels that go on for the last 10 years, right? Uh, but I need something that, that happens at the moment, right? And so it might be very different uh, to talk about historic data and to talk about current data, talk about fresh data, right? Uh, so that's kind of like uh, difficult. Um, it has also something to do, which is very often the case, uh, with legislation, right? Because um, if, you, if you're um, uh, managing a company and collecting all the data from the company, uh, the data might have been collected under different laws, right? Uh, so, for example, in, in America, um, uh, there were some uh, very big changes in uh, legislation uh, due to the Enron scandal. Who has heard about the Enron scandal? Nobody? Okay, cool. Um, so the Enron scandal was basically a scheme uh, where a company invested in sub-companies and used them as bag, bad banks, right? So they burned a lot of money and always used these companies of, uh, as bad banks. And when they were near to becoming bankrupt, uh, they founded new sub-companies, which then again uh, would be invested in and were used as bad banks, right? And it, it kind of like um, uh, uh, went on for a while and then it crashed, of course. Uh, because in the end, they only had bad banks. Um, and um, a lot of money was, was uh, uh, basically um, uh, wasted for that, and, and a lot of investors uh, were fraudulently um, uh, uh, parted from their money. Um, so legislation thought they had to do something, and they had to, especially uh, when, they, when they were following up on that, uh, everybody claimed, well, I didn't know that was a bad bank, right? I thought that was a, um, uh, a subsidiary company, right? And uh, so one of the problems in the Enron um, uh, uh, lawsuits that, that emerged was uh, to find out who knew what when, right? And that was when the whole email communication of Enron um, uh, uh, had to come up and had to be um, uh, um, opened. And um, it's, it's still an interesting corpus to see that email communication, and, and it's used very often for um, uh, in, in um, information retrieval tasks and so on. Um, because it's very complex, and the uh, legislation after that, to kind of like not do it again that way, uh, changed due to the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, um, that uh, needed all bigger companies, so all in the Fortune 500, um, to store all the data they have uh, permanently, right, in an undeletable storage, so in 
optical media or whatever, right? So um, that uh, it cannot just be lost at a convenient time, right? And uh, so if you, have, if you have different laws, if you have different legislation on your data, you might have to store things that you don't need in your processes, right? But that's just there for legislation, right? And partitioning that and, and saying, okay, that goes here in that, in that basement storage and uh, will never be met with again because we don't do funny subsidiary schemes or uh, money laundry schemes, uh, schemes. Uh, that's, that's one thing. <coughs> okay, so um, data partitioning always involves having that big table that is usually a fact table or uh, uh, usually smaller the dimension tables of the data warehouse. Um, into multiple tables, right? And you can do that in two ways. You can do that horizontally or you can do that vertically, right? So if I take the fact table with a lot of entries and store different blocks of that in different partitions, that's a horizontal partitioning, right? If I take a bigger table like a dimension table and say, okay, these columns with all the records go here and these columns with all the records go there, uh, that's a vertical partitioning, right? So we always, um, uh, uh, um, distinguish horizontal versus vertical partitioning by the way that the master table is basically. Um, in the horizontal partitioning, you take the tuples and store the tuples of the same table under the same schema in different partitions, right? So what you, what you have is a set of relations, right, uh, that have been derived from some master relation if the schema of every relation and the tuples of every relation is a subset as the same, uh, the master table, if the partitions are empty, uh, no, if the intersections between different partitions are empty, and when you union all the partitions, you get the complete master table, so nothing is lost, right? Um, it's a disjoint storage scheme of the tuples of a table in subtables with the same schema, right? Um, and there's different ways to do that. There's basically uh, three ways of, of uh, um, doing that. And now I will kind of try to, yeah, it works. Um, <laughs> and me. Um, okay, so. <laughs> we will leave its will. Um, so there's the range partitioning, where you just say, okay, the, the, um, the, 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 the tuples in the original table are stored in a, certain, in a certain sequence, right? Why don't I divide these segments in ranges and just say, okay, um, I do a selection on the master relation, right, by some predicates. And First come all the data of 2013, then comes all the data of 2014, and then comes all the data of 2015. So I order the master relation by the year, right? And then I kind of like take the tuples apart by storing the uh, 2014 tuples in a different relation than the 2015 tuples and the 2013 tuples, right? And uh, this, is, this is kind of what I can do. And I cannot only do that by a single predicate, I can do that by several predicates. For example, I could do something like country is Germany and year is 2015, or uh, the German data beforehand, so um, the year is smaller than 2015, and all the other countries, because I don't have much business there anywhere, in its own partition, right? Overseas departments or whatever. Um, so this is basically uh, what can be done for a range partitioning scheme. Second is a list partitioning scheme, where I say, well, um, the data is somehow classified, right? So the data is marked up by a certain predicate, right? And a partition is assigned for a list of these predicates, right? So if a row belongs to a certain predicate, it is stored in the partition of that predicate, right? So uh, 
Um, for example, all the rows where the column country is either Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Finland, or Denmark, so that's Scandinavia, right? And, and I just made up a classification for Scandinavian country and non-Scandinavian country, right? Um, uh, by, by, by having that list or by having some um, uh, you could also do something like um, uh, age ranges for persons, for customers, you know, you could have different segments, you could have um, uh, youthful people and you could have people in their 20s and people in their 30s and so on. Uh, so every uh, classification, every, every partitioning uh, that you might want uh, that has some, some um, uh, well, semantic meaning if you want it like that. And of course, um, getting these partitions is a restriction um, on the on the attribute. So, for example, city in Hamburg, Hanover, and Berlin, or uh, city city in some 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 default other values uh, than what I just said, right? And then you get again a complete disjoint partitioning, and then you got a partitioning by different value lists. The third possibility is the hash partitioning, and in the hash partitioning, uh, the, um, uh, the, the distribution of tuples is somehow random. That means not entirely random, but determined by a hash function. So I uh, take a hash function. Um, everyone knows what a hash function is? Yes? Yes? Okay. So I take a hash function on some predicate, right? and then calculate its value, and the hash function has spans a number of buckets, I don't know, like 128 or something like that, in the case of SHA-1, for example, um, and uh, then every tuple is thrown into one of these buckets, and this is unique, right? So uh, you can always recover if you uh, hash the same value, uh, you always get the same bucket, so that's uh, kind of, kind of, um, um, used very often. This is used very often, um, not so much for handling the data differently, because uh, with, the, uh, with the hash function, you cannot, I mean, it's always thrown in the same bucket, the same value, right? But, but you cannot predict which bucket it will be. You have to, to calculate the hash function, right? So um, it, you don't have any guarantee that tuples that are similar or that belong together in some sense are in the same bucket, right? Um, but what you can do is that you, um, or what, what you do today very often is when you, when you do data mining, uh, you do things like map reduce, right? So you, you, you take some of these uh, big frameworks, um, Hadoop or whatever, for parallelization purposes. So uh, you, you um, uh, compute some uh, process individually on subsets of the data and then merge it at a, at a later step, right? So you map it to different operators and then uh, you reduce the result uh, to, to get a single result again. And uh, for this kind of processing, um, the hash partitioning is a very good uh, kind of partitioning because it tends to distribute the data evenly into these buckets, right? Uh, so you get partitions of the same size or of similar size, uh, which uh, uh, lends it for, uh, very, very well to, um, uh, to the uh, parallelization schemes, you know, like in, depending on the number of cores uh, that you have in your, in your processing unit, right, uh, you might assess one of these partitions to each core that is working uh, basically in parallel to the other cores, and this is done very often today. So uh, the, the idea is that for each tuple of the master relation, you use a hash function um, that then will associate uh, to the to the certain partition and um, with all the tuples that are within a certain partition uh, they say they have the same hash key right they have the same value of the hash function if the hash function is applied to it so this is what describes the data uniquely okay so um, for the data partitioning you usually do not use any predicate, but usually use the dimensional predicates, right? And there are some dimensions that are very often used. Uh, for example, the time dimension is very popular. 
and um, that that has something to do with uh, the staleness of data, right? I mean, um, of course, in a data warehouse, you want to see uh, the bigger picture. You want to see big processes spanning over years uh, um, at, at some point. But you also need the operational data. You also need, um, okay, we did this promotion uh, last month or two months ago. So how did it turn out? You know, like what happened actually? And so uh, shorter periods such as week or month um, uh, are often used uh, where, where the, um, the newer data is stored in different partitions to answer such questions uh, very, very efficiently and very quickly, right? So um, you usually distribute by time dimension, right? Um, if you use other dimensions than time, there's, for example, location that is very often used, um, uh, then there's, there's also a lot of uh, sensible aggregations that you can use that, right? Um, the dimension structure as such will not change, right? Uh, but you, you can always decide, so many companies do it in, in a certain way that they uh, say, okay, we have the Asian countries, we have the Americas, we have uh, EMEA, so Europe, Middle East, Af Africa, right? And, and, and kind of distribute that also in a, in, a, in a sense of management, right? And you have different managers for the different, uh, different areas. Um, and uh, if you do that, also a data partitioning, because they will run their own query, and they are basically interested in um, uh, in, in their areas, right, and not so much in the other areas, only maybe in spread tables where they compare to other areas. But uh, direct joins between data of the Europe and America, that does not really happen too much. So customers who bought something in America and in Europe, yeah, might happen and might be interesting for some purposes, but rather not, right, so not so often. Um, so that is that is kind of kind of uh, the idea. Um, if you don't figure uh, or if you don't focus on a dimension, uh, very often uh, you also say, okay, uh, I need the tables, I need the partitions to be in a certain size, right? So um, I don't want them to be bigger than a couple of megabytes uh, because the data mining algorithms might not might not be able to swallow it, especially if you're working on things like, like Hadoop, if you're working on MapReduce frameworks, right, and want to do parallelization. Having two big chunks that are um, maybe even randomly distributed, right? Uh, think, think, for example, about a German company that has some subsidiaries doing a little bit of business in, in the US and maybe China or something like that, right? The most data will be from Germany if you partition by region, right? You will have one big lump and two smaller lumps, right? Uh, which is not a good partitioning scheme if you want to do data mining on it, right? So, um, it, very often it's, it's a sensible thing, especially for parallelization, especially for uh, data mining, um, if, if you use um, predefined sizes uh, that are just good to handle or that are good uh, to transfer over the network without adding too much delay or without being too difficult. Okay, uh, the other idea, not horizontal, is vertical partitioning, right? So you have a table and you have different columns in the table. So think about the fact table, for example. Uh, you have all the key information in the fact table and then you have the different measures in the fact table, right? Adding to a lot of data. Um, sometimes it's, um, it's um, uh, you always see these data warehouses in practice um, where, where you really go like, okay, so how many attributes do you have? Oh, it's just 1,064 or something like that because that was the maximum number that the database system would allow. And you go like, 1,000 columns? I mean, what, what do you store? Oh, and then we need this and this and this and this and this and it goes on for ages, right? Um, uh, so, so more often than not, you will see very bad designs in, in industry uh, that either have come down from a legacy system, right? So it just evolved that way, right? And somebody needed new columns and somebody needed new data fields, right? And so they were just put in and, and uh, they did not know how to consolidate their schema. They did not do a, um, a managed evolution of the schema, but it just was... was freely growing, right? So you will see that very often. Um, 
in, in, in these cases, vertical partitioning is an absolute must, right? So what you want is tables with fewer columns where the um, uh, um, uh, key information is basically directly um, uh, stored with some of the sensibly grouped um, uh, uh, payload information, right? And um, what you do here is, is called row splitting. Um, and um, the different partitions are in a one-to-one -one relationship uh, by the key information that they hold. So each of the partition has to hold the keys, right? And then you can complete the tuples if you have to. But usually, if you think about these uh, thousand, thousand column tables, right, it's not sensible to, to have the whole tuple um, at, at any point, right? So that's kind of, kind of like the idea. Um, the, the good thing if you, if you partition that way is that um, <coughs> you, you, you can store the, uh, the different partitionings on different devices. So, for example, what happens very often um, is that, for example, if you have a product uh, uh, dimension, that descriptions of the product or something are part of the, um, uh, um, of, of the data warehouse, right? Uh, and then you have text columns, right, that cannot be mined or used in, in, in any sensible way, right, because it just contains these character large objects because, well, that's an SQL standard, so you can do that, right? And the database administrator at some point um, or application programmer thought it would, it would be a perfect idea to do it, right? And then when you do data mining and, and always uh, go through these columns, right, and it takes ages, uh, you decide, um, no, that's actually not a very good idea to do. I, I would put that on a different device, and, and, and uh, this might be uh, stored for later uh, uh, processing at some point, but on a, uh, on a, on a, on a slower device or something like that, uh, where you don't have to attach, uh, to, to assess, access it very often, right? So um, with the vertical partitioning, um, the partitioning scheme means that you move the data that is rarely used, right, to other devices or to other partitions, whereas the data that is very often connected, that would be needed to, to be joined, right, if it would be in different um, uh, uh, partitions, is kept together, is kept intact, because you want to avoid joins. By all means, joints cost um, uh, um, execution time. So that's that's kind of the idea. So um, you have you have highly used partitioning part, uh, of the data, uh, hot columns they are very often called um, columns uh, or predicates that occur in very many queries, right? And you want to have, have those hot columns in different partitions from the cold columns uh, that are rarely used, if even, right? Um, you can always restore the original table, the original tuples, by doing a join between the two uh, partitions or by, by creating a view um, across, the, um, uh, across the tables, right? Um, of course, by doing this join, you get a performance penalty because you have to kind of like use indexes or however the join is actually implemented and, and that can be done. Um, on the other hand, what you get for it is uh, that the uh, performance for working only on the hot data uh, will increase, will dramatically increase sometimes because you're not going through the, or you're not reading uh, the, um, the cold columns all the time. And for data mining, that is very, very important. Um, sometimes you have very large dimension tables, um, like for example, the uh, customer table of Amazon. Um, uh, that has millions and billions of records, right? And uh, most of these attributes are rarely, if at all, queried, right? So you might have address fields that are only interesting if you um, uh, kind of deliver uh, something, right? So that is never used or hardly ever used for, for uh, data analysis. You basically have region codes for that um, if, if you want to do a regional um, analysis, right? So this is, this is kind of kind of... Uh, not really uh, necessary, right? Um, but the link between the fact table and all the dimensions, right, needs to be 
um, maintained. So whenever something in the fact table or in the dimension table uh, is, is, is changed, it also affects the indexes, it also affects the, the key information in the fact table, right? Um, and uh, this has, of course, high performance costs. So uh, the idea uh, here is to use so-called mini dimensions, right? Uh, which is a special case of vertical partitioning, where you say, oh, well, well, basically, I have this customer dimension, right, that was telling me all the information that we have about customers, but I'm kind of cutting it into the um, direct customer information where the address is stored and all this stuff that I need for delivery, that I need for for, for uh, marketing reasons, right? And all the information that I collected about the customer, what did he buy and what uh, is he interested in and uh, does he prefer uh, books or DVDs or whatever, right? Um, all that information that uh, Amazon is definitely collecting um, is in different tables, is in different dimensions. So you have the uh, customer mining or customer recommendation dimension, and you have the uh, customer handling dimension with the address, uh, delivery address, and, and, and stuff like that um, in it, right? And uh, you decide on, on, on what you use. So for example, um, uh, for, for all the interactions that you do with, with Amazon, um, uh, the uh, the recommendation is, is is kind of very very often done right so uh, when when browsing right you uh, very frequently use uh, some dimension attributes right um, however actually buying something happens um, uh, well um, not too often right and that means that your actual address is very rarely accessed, right, for the delivery purposes. And this, this is kind of the, the idea of a mini dimension. You're separating dimension into dimensions that would belong together, that is all customer information, but, but you say, okay, this is customer information for the handling side, this is customer information for the recommendation side or for the mining side, and uh, they should be in different, in different groups, right? Okay. Um, for these different dimensions, you can, of course, use different indexing schemes because you use different operations on them, right? So you might, on the customer handling side, you might uh, use uh, things for logistics and, 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 and kind of try to uh, figure out how to, how to build good tours or when to send or package what, right? Or can some things be repackaged, uh, whereas on the um, uh, customer uh, recommendation uh, um, uh, columns, uh, you would do something like data mining, like association rule mining, like collaborative filtering, so typical data mining algorithms that uh, might work out. So these mini dimensions, how does it look like? Well, it uh, looks like this. So if you have a fact table uh, that has kind of like uh, all the information about uh, customers and uh, geo information and so on, uh, and then you have a customer table, and usually the customer table um, uh, would contain all the information about customer. When you're doing something on um, uh, demography, so you want to, um, uh, to, to, to ask yourself, how can I reach senior citizens, and what are they buying, and how can I put them in advertising campaigns and stuff like that, right? Uh, you need aggregations over this customer ID. Um, if you don't want that, what you do is you derive a different dimension uh, for, the, for the customer ID that is then directly tied into the fact table as a mini dimension that contains basically the same data as the customer ID, only in aggregated form and can be directly used, right? So this is the basic idea with mini dimensions. Okay, oh, sorry. Does it? Yes, it works. Okay. Um, so uh, the uh, vertical partitioning is basically that uh, all the mini dimensions uh, are different classes and can be handled separately, can be handled individually, are usually much smaller and uh, very often applied to those attributes that you need for mining purposes. Um, key to the mini dimension can be placed as a foreign key in the fact table that it has been derived from, but also directly um, uh, in, in the dimension table uh, where the data has been taken from, right? So that's kind of like uh, uh, two access paths that you have on the same table, right? 
Um, of course, they should be small and compact, so mining does not cost too much effort. So partitioning in horizontal or vertical way um, has different uh, advantages. The records that are used together by analytical queries are grouped together right, and can be accessed together in the best case, read sequentially from disk together. Right? So that is, that is basically a basic idea. Um, each partition can be optimized individually for performance. You have better security, you have better recovery possibilities, you can store them on, on different disks so you don't have contention thrashing and stuff like that. You can, you can handle the delays, you can hand, uh, have different processing nodes that work on different um, uh, parts of, of, of the network um, and parallel processing is all over the place at the moment, be it multi-kernel or uh, really different processing units. On the other hand, if you need to access data in full tuples, you need to make joints about the, um, over the different partitions. That costs time, obviously, right? And you're adding to some complexity because you, you need to know where your data is, right? So this is kind of the idea. And we want to show you some partitioning that is sensible. And uh, that brings us to our first detour. Mm -hmm. Detour. Here we go. Your voice is kind of down today. Yes, it's getting worse, my cold. Okay. Sadly. So we've been talking about partitioning and um, how do we actually do it uh, when you're out there in a company or what are the rules of thumbs? Well. Actually, when they start building a data warehouse, at the very beginning, they don't come up with a partitioning scheme because usually you start off maybe uh, unless you're already a very well-founded company and you already have uh, a lot of data. But if you start off slowly, then your data warehouse doesn't have already a lot of data. But at one point, when it grows out of hand, um, partitioning cannot be avoided. And um, as the rule of thumb, Oracle says, as soon as a table is bigger than two gigabyte then uh, you, you have to start to think about partitioning. Um, practically, a lot of people, what they do is, as soon as they see that uh, a table is bigger than 100 million rows, uh, which is uh, actually unavoidable, when you think of the fact table, it will probably uh, reach uh, that, um, that size and, and will grow more. So as soon as it hits the 100 million rows, uh, <coughs> go into partitioning to, to, to boost your performance. Um, Although fundamental and you will have to use it, <clears throat> however, it doesn't run as smoothly or um, as good as we, want, as we wanted it to be. So there are problems and I will uh, show you that in the next few slides. But um, initially, what, what, what is usually our expectations or what do we um, um, want for our partition management to do? Well, the key thing is we want transparency. And what that means is um, that the applications that are working on top of your data warehouse, on top of your fact table, um, it shouldn't realize that the data underneath is partitioned or separated. So on the logical level, everything needs to seem or to look like that it's one big table. And um, you shouldn't realize that physically, on the physical level, they are partitioning. So all of this needs to be done internally, this conversion between the physical partitions up to the logical level, this has to be done internally and with transparency. A very also important thing to look at is data consistency. So whatever is stored on the different partitions, it has to comply to consistency as if it was just stored in one table. Problem is, although um, this transparency is exactly what we need, it is not yet a standard. And you'll see now, as an example here uh, from Oracle, that it doesn't always work um, and meet our expectations. So an example here, we're just going to be looking at range partitions. So Oracle supports other types of partitioning, of course, list, hash, and partitioning, all the different partitioning we talked about today. And as we've talked, range partitioning basically means you look at a column or a combinations of column and you use the values that are inside to basically then define the boundaries of the different partitions. 
And the two key semantics or syntax keywords is partition by range. And here you define basically the column that you're going to be partition, to partition on. Most likely people tend to use range partition with the time column, the time dimension. And then the second key syntax here is values less than, so you define basically the boundary that you're going to use. So an example here, you want to create a partition on the table sales, and it has basically a product dimension, geographical dimension, and the date dimension, and the measure is the profit, and we want to partition based on <coughs> the time dimension. And we define two partitions. The first dimension is called before 2014, and the second partitions it's called 2014. And the only way that Orca allows you to partition is by identifying the lower bound, which is given here by values less than. So all the partitions that you then design, they are, you always identify the lower bound for this partition. All the values less than 2014, for instance, are placed here. However, for all the partitions that are in the middle, you always have the upper bound also implicitly then identified because this is basically the lower bound of everything that is bigger than 2014, which is identified by the bigger partition. So the only two exceptions that you have here is the first partition where no lower bound is identified, but basically this would be then everything that is lower, so smaller than the first lower bound that, it, that you identified for the second partition. And for the last partition, where there is no upper bound, you identify that by saying maximum value. So um, if you hadn't done it in the previous um, code, you just can say, I'm altering the table sales and I'm adding a new partition, and it's everything that is after 2014 or after 2015, and because you don't know the upper bound, you just say maximum value, and this is basically, it means its value is up to infinity, and also this partition would include all the, all the tuples whose values in the time dimension was null. So, <clears throat> until now, everything seems to be working smoothly. So let's see how that actually looks like um, visually. So this is the sales table that we wanted to partition. And if you remember, we partitioned on the time dimension. And we created three dimension. So the first two dimensions were basically everything that was less than 2014. And if you see here, basically you do a cut. You take everything that is less, like that. And then the second partition has everything that is bigger than 2014. And the third partition has up to infinity. So every new tuple that comes that is higher and higher will go here. And anything that had null as well goes in this partition. <coughs> so it seems good. So when does problems or when might problems arise? Well. If you're in a data cleaning phase or you're doing modifications, of course, we said this doesn't often happen. However, thinking of a scenario where you're having real-time uh, data warehousing where you actually need to access the data in the staging area, then any update that happens in the staging area needs to be reflected in the, in the data that you're currently using. So one update that might cause a problem is, of course, if you're updating the attribute that you actually partitioned with. So for example here, if you update the time ID, and instead of it being 2013, you want it now to be 2014. So that means that the row actually has to jump, be deleted from this table, and inserted in the right partition, the partition that holds all the 2014 values. If you do that in Oracle, <coughs> you will get an error which is actually good because then it actually grabs your attention that uh, something here is going to happen. You're gonna, you want to move a tuple into another partition and you have to be careful about what's going to happen. Um, you can, if you get the error, you basically force it, enforce it, and 
You do that by an alter table statement and you say enable row movement. The problem here is, um, is that Oracle, the way it actually organizes data or it identified the tuples is by row IDs and this is automatic uh, enumeration for the tuples that are given by um, Oracle. And what you see in a lot of the in practical, in practice, what people do in the update statement here, update sales, set time ID to the new value where the row ID equal 121. So you're identifying the row by this primary key that Oracle basically automatically assigns. And though this is not recommended, however, the assumption or what they claim is that this number is valid throughout the lifetime of the tuple and it will never change. However, in reality, that is not the case, unfortunately. And what you see is as soon as you enforce the row movement, what will happen is it will delete the record from the previous partition and put it in its correct partition. However, it doesn't retain the number, but it changes the ID number. And of course, now, as you can imagine, if you have any scripts that was working on the row ID, then this will, will break down. So probably another idea is to put your own primary key and, and work with that. Shall we do a break now or do we continue? Okay, so for 10 minutes and then we start again. So, um, we've been talking about partitionings and um, a second <coughs> part of optimization is um, how you actually deal with this, the new structure of uh, what, you, what you just partitioned. And uh, if you have several partitionings or if you uh, uh, instated uh, several partitions, you need joins over the data sometimes, right? And these joins can cost an arbitrary lot of time, so it's a very expensive um, operation. And uh, joins per se are very expensive, but you can do them in clever ways so that the Im intermediate results are kind of like um, uh, controlled, um, or you can do that in the most unclever ways, um, <coughs> where you get huge results, uh, intermediate results, right, <coughs> that need to be materialized, and then you're trying to um, figure out what to do. Um, who has heard uh, databases 2, RDB2? Okay, not too many. Well, um, if you had heard uh, Relational Databases 2, which is a very interesting lecture of uh, the EFIS Institute, um, we have spent a lot of time in query optimization on join order optimization, right? So, what is the perfect order? Uh, for doing joins. And um, the whole thing relies on the, on the inside. The joins are commutative, so you can switch uh, kind of like tables. Uh, the, the outcome of R joined with S is the same as uh, the outcome of S joined with R. Just the, um, the sequence of the columns is, 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 is kind of different. Otherwise, it's, it's just the same thing. And it's associative, so joining two tables first and then joining a third table uh, to the result of the join, uh, right, is exactly the same thing as joining the last tables first and joining the first table uh, later on, right? So that, that can be done um, uh, all the time. And um, if you think about optimizing that, um, you get different you get different plans. You always have the uh, different relations. Here are the relations in the gray boxes, right? And they have to be joined, and then you can think about different strategies of joining them. So, for example, if you have uh, four tables that need to be joined, you can just join two of them, and then join the third of them, and then join the fourth of them, and then that's that, right? Um, which is one possible join tree. Or you can join two of them and two other of them and then join them together, right? And the resulting structures are called join trees because you have different operator trees, right? And uh, different shapes of join trees, for example, this bushy shape here or this kind of like um, uh, 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 left-hanging shape here um, may show very different performances when um, uh, doing the, the evaluation, right? Um, 
within each shape, you can then also switch the columns, so you can, uh, the the um, uh, the relations. So you could say, okay, I want the U here, and I want the S here, for example, right? Just you know, switching because it's all commutative, right? You can do it in, in either way you want. So you have different join tree shapes, and you have different orders of the um, relations, which gives you a lot of possibilities to perform a single join, right? So um, there's actually um, quite a lot of assignments possible, and if you want to know how many, um, then uh, I have to refer you to the, to the Sterling numbers. Um, so um, the possible joint trees grows rapidly with the number of relations, and um, the, the idea behind that is that any number of the relations may be in the left subtree and ordered in recursively the left subtree and so on, right? While the rem remaining forms may be in the right subtree and may be ordered again in the same form, right? If you start with two, that's pretty easy. If you start with three, that's pretty easy too, right? But as soon as you get up to five, six, seven, so it doesn't have to be a really big number. It's, it's just, you know, like five, six, seven uh, 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 tables that you need to join, which happens in data warehouses quite often, right? And then you get an arbitrary number of uh, different joint uh, possibilities of, of, of uh, doing the join. So your optimizer then has, of course, three choices. Um, it can consider all possible joint trees, right? And just take the, the cheapest one, right, that has the best cost estimation. But um, looking at the number of possibilities that you have, uh, that's, that's usually prohibitive. So if you have more than four joints, I would say, Forget about it, it's too many. It's too many possibilities. And uh, enumerating them and, and, and kind of like doing the cost estimation for all of them uh, does not, does not uh, make the query any, any faster, so that does not really work. Um, most of the optimizers um, just um, use a subset of the trees. Uh, so for example, um, uh, the um, Vulcano optimizer, which was is at the heart of, of, of the DB2 database, IBM's database system, um, just uses left deep trees. So uh, it, it, it uh, always follows the strategy by joining two tables and then joining subsequently tables on top of that result, right? Um, that has been done very often. Um, or you could use heuristics to pe pick a certain shape. So certain shapes might be more suitable for your computing environment than certain other shapes. Yeah? So the classical join order optimization is actually discussed in RDB2, which I can very much recommend. Um, it's a very interesting lecture, and actually I think um, the uh, join order optimization lecture is next week. So if you want to um, just look into join order optimization, this is your chance next week and Wednesdays, Wednesdays around noon, right? Okay. So, but for data warehouses, uh, the problem is slightly different because what we don't have is not the classical, uh, oh, we have different relations and they are all <coughs> kind of uh, 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 connected by, um, by relationships, right? Uh, so the tables are connected by relationships and, and are joined over these relationships. Um, but what we have is, is, is kind of the star shape, right? We have the central fact table, and then we have the dimension table that are all tied in um, to that, to that uh, fact table. And uh, the resulting join that you do by product, uh, whoops, product ID here is product ID here, right? And uh, time ID here is time ID here, and geo ID here is geo ID here, right? Uh, the, the resulting join that you do is called, since it's a star schema, a star join because all the keys from the dimension tables are joined to the um, centrally stored keys in, in the fact table, right? And you have another um, uh, interesting um, uh, organizational thing here because um, where is the load of the data, right? I mean, this table tells you how many different dates there are, right? This table tells you how many different products there are. This table tells you how many locations you have for stores or for factories or whatever you're looking at, right? 
But this table here in the middle holds all the information about your daily operations. Every sale that is done by any person in the world at any point in time, right? So chances are that this table will be very big and these tables will be rather small. Right? Um, keeping that in mind, we have different situation to the classical um, relational database join order optimization. Right? And still, what we have to do in many queries is uh, this typical kind of joining of the, um, uh, of the dimensional relations into the fact table um, with some selections, I don't know, countries, Germany, and product group is washing machine, right? Um, so this is, kind of, this is kind of the situation that we are facing um, in data warehousing, different schema, mm, different types of table, and uh, usually very imbalanced kind of um, kind of uh, uh, load in the table or number of tuples in the table. So, kind of interesting to see. How do we then perform the joints, right? It's if you if you strict if you restrict your joint shape, right, to the fact table plus all the dimensions. And the fact table, remember, the fact table is central and covers in a star scheme all the different dimensions. So all the joints are between the fact table and the key in the dimension table, right? There's no joints between dimension tables, right? Does not happen because the, the key information is not there, right? Might be with many dimensions, but usually not, right? Usually that's forbidden. So what you're kind of doing, oops, this does not work. What you're kind of doing is you start with the first join, for example, the join over here, right? Sales and geo, and you join it. You have a result, and then you join with the next table, right? This is kind of what happens here. Get a bigger result. Right? <coughs> and then you have a complete result and you join with the next table. Right? This is what happens here. So you only get a certain, um, a certain type of trees that are all of these um, deep left kind, right? With the fact table, oops, with the fact table at the root because that contains all the necessary keys. Clear? What happens? Well, the good thing is that restricts the join order, that restricts the, 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 the trees that you can build, and it's still quite a lot of trees, quite a lot of join orders that you have, but it's not as many as it used to be. It's not the sterling numbers anymore, but it's, it's uh, only, <laughs> only the faculty. Right, which is bad enough, bad news, right? So let's look at how that actually works, right? Um, we can use some heuristics, of course. Um, in online transaction databases in RDB2, what we say is, well, basically, before you do any Cartesian products between tables that have no common attribute, try to push selection very close to the, to, the, to the tables so that you can use joints between tables. It's much more efficient because a, um, a, a, a Cartesian product will basically make all pairs, all combinations, cardinality of the first table times cardinality of the second table in result size. Blah. A lot of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas a join by using the selection, will throw most of the tuples just out and only connect those that have the same common value, right? A lot less. 
So this is, this is a very typical heuristic that you find in normal databases, right? Um, so, for example, if you would try to uh, have the geolocation with the time location, right? The geolocation has the geo ID, the time ID, uh, 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 location has the time ID. They have no single attribute in common, right? Joining them means doing a Cartesian product. Okay. Cartesian products, bad. We know that. On the other hand, if we look at data warehouses, right, these heuristics might no longer be applicable because it's correct that Cartesian products lead to big intermediate results by joining all the tables, uh, all the tuples. But if we have a skewed distribution of records in the tuples, if we have this one big fact table and all the dimension tables are very small, then joining two small tables might be actually a better idea than joining something with the big fat um, fact table, right? So let's look at what happens, for example, if we take the, uh, the, the sales, our fact table, with the geolocation, right, and, and join it. And we even have a uh, selection on the geolocation, uh, the country is Germany. I, we only want German, German stuff, right? So let's assume sales has 10 million records. In Germany there are 10 stores, um, date, and so on, and so on, and so on. If 20% of these sales were performed in Germany, Selectivity is rather small, and we wouldn't need an index because 20% reading of the blocks, that's kind of like five times than doing a linear scan. That's not, not kind of interesting. 10 million results, 20% is 2 million records, right? So we would create, by doing this, by doing this join over here, right? We would create an intermediate result of 2 million records, right? And that is all the sales that happen in Germany. Okay. Good. What if we do a cross product, a Cartesian product, of the dimension tables first and then join it to the uh, sales table? So what we do first is a Cartesian product of all the dimension tables with all the selections that have been done. And at the very end, just before the final result is detected, we join it with the big sales table. Right? Let's look at it. We do the same assumptions like we did before. Okay, the geo, geo dimension has 10 stores, time dimension 20 days, product dimension uh, 50 products, right? If we do the cross product, we take 10 times 20 is 200, times 50 is 10,000 records. Full Cartesian product, this year is 10,000 records, as opposed to 10 million here, right? That's not too bad, right? So the, um, the, the selectivity of 10,000 records versus, versus 10 million records that we get is 0.1%, not 20, like we did when we joined just the geolocation, which individually just had 20% selectivity, right? So, 10 million times 0.1, right, does not give us the 2 million records in the intermediate result that we, ha uh, that we, that we had, but just 100,000. Right? Much less. 100,000 records, that's manageable. Right? Just 1% of the fact table. 
not 20. But it's only for, for one. The, the what do you mean for one? The records were only for one dimension. It was only for geolocation. No, 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 no. The fact table holds 10 million tuples overall. So if you, no, here, here. So the, the fact table holds 2 million records. If you consider that the geo table has a selectivity of 20%, right? 20% of these 10 million records are 2 million records yeah. in, the, in the intermediate result. Yeah. If by doing the cross product here, I push down selectivity to a single percent, uh, to, to uh, 0.1 percent, right? I get a much better selectivity of the 10 million records over here. Performing this join over here, right, creates an intermediate result. Of 2 million records. Of 2 million records. So you, you still had to do the, the same then with the time and with the product. Exactly. But you have to materialize these 2 million records over here to do the next join. Yeah. Right? And the, the um, advantage of the second thing is if I do it in this way, I do these Cartesian products and I materialize 10,000 tuples, not 2 million, right? And then doing the join here with the 10 million tuples will give me the better selectivity. Clear? What we want to avoid is big intermediate results, right? We will see it in the D2 um, in, 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 in due course. But, uh, so this is called a star join and obviously it follows uh, slightly different um, uh, 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 rules from um, what OLTP systems usually do. So we've reached the point where we said, okay, a better idea is to basically start with the Cartesian products of the dimensions to get a smaller intermediate result and to join that in the end with the fact table. That, however, isn't a perfect solution if you have one of two things. If you have a lot of different dimension tables, many dimension tables, and if you have actually big dimension tables, think of Amazon, if they have a data warehouse that tracks the sales, uh, imagine the dimension of the products. They have millions of products, so the dimension is big. If you also put on top of the scenario that your selectivity is actually small on the big dimension table, then what we mentioned the slide before is not basically the best solution, but then we have to go further and do something else in order to, to boost the performance back to, to where it was. So, for example here, so that you can actually visualize that, let's assume that the selectivity that we have. So we have here, our company have 100 stores in Germany, so we want to care about products in Germany. There's 100 stores there, and we sell 1,000 electronic products. And we will be looking in 2014, so just only this year, so we have basic cardinality of 300 working days. And this is basically what we need to work with. So if we did what, what we did a few slides ago, what do we do? We start off with the geograph geography table, and our selectivity here is Germany, which basically gives us 100 stores in Germany. On the other side, the timetable. We're working in 2014, and we had 300 working days. A Cartesian product here gives you 30,000 tuples in the table. Next step, you join that with the third dimension, the product dimension. And just selecting the electronic products, we had 1,000 electronic products. Cartesian products gives you an intermediate result of 30 million tuples. The fact table on its own has 100 million tuples. So basically, the intermediate result that you have here now is about 
of the size of the fact table. And you see now that if you have such a case, um, this is not really the ideal solution. You have to do something about it because it's going to be expensive. Whether you start with the fact table or you start from, from the other side here, it's still not, not doable within a good um, time. And the first actually implemented solution for that was in DB2 by IBM. And what they, what they thought of was, all right, what we do is on the fact table, for every dimension, we start building an index. And uh, they use B star trees. And as soon as the query optimizer realizes that, well, you're getting it, we have big dimensions getting a query that the selectivity is small, then it follows a certain plan, which is to use the indexes it built and to start doing semi joins between every index and the corresponding dimension. So, what does that mean? Well, basically, on the geographical ta on geography table, you have the index that is already pre-built. You do the selection of geography, and then you do a semi-join. So here it's a left semi-join, which means it basically returns in the intermediate result here all the entries in the index that has a corresponding value in the geography table. And then here you have a smaller table because actually we're only working with indices which is basically only the keys. And if you start to do that for all the different dimension and all the different indices that you've built to every dimension in your fact table, then you get small intermediate results and at the end you have a smaller table to join with the fact table. So let's look at it more uh, in depth. Here we have the geography table you do the selection on Germany, so you only get three results that are here. On the other hand, you have the index that you built on the dimension of the geography on the fact table. And what you do here is a semi-join. And then basically then, you are only looking in the index here, and you join it with the table here, which is basically then the one, the one here, so only two results. If you see here, you just have the IDs of the index and the IDs of the table in the geography. How does that actually look then if you do it on all the different dimensions? So for the query, we just tried a couple of minutes ago and we had 30 million tuples at the end. Well, for every dimension, you, start, you proceed with the following plan. You first start with the geography, you do the selection, and then on the corresponding index you do the semi-join. Same thing on the product. You apply the selection, and with the index you create a semi-join. Same thing for the time. And then at the end here you have the index, the three indices. And at the end the only thing you need to do is basically an intersection between these indexes. And what you get here at the end is what you basically then join with the fact table. So you basically then just get the IDs, do the intersection, and then retrieve the actual tuples. Sounds good? Very good. We. <coughs> yep. So we see there are a lot of tricks that you can do for query optimization, yeah. and uh, you have to look very well at your data uh, to see what's actually happening. The last optimization, important optimization that I want to discuss in data warehouses are so-called materialized views. Um, that means all the tuples that are stored in the database, right? Of course, you need to materialize the base tables, sure, but you can also materialize different aggregations of the base data, right? And these aggregations cost some overhead because you need to maintain them and when something changes you need also to, to update the aggregates and so on. But they can be directly accessed because they are pre-computed, they are stored. Instead of they have to be computed on the fly, right? So that's the different. Um, so um, the, 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 the good thing is that you have fast access 
but you have maintenance cost, right? And what you would want is incremental maintenance cost, right? That you don't have to change all the indexes and all and everything um, uh, all the time um, uh, when something changes, but uh, only only parts of it or only only uh, slightly, right? So the question is, of course, how can you use the materialized views in, in, in data warehouses? And if you look um, uh, at um, materialization of um, uh, tuples, the important question is always, what are you going to need, right? So what are the users actually asking for? The question what you materialize or the decision what you materialize very strongly depends on the profile of your queries, of what you expect the users to ask, right? So let's assume we have queries um, that need a join of the sales table with some other table and aggregate uh, the result, right? So we have, for example, here um, the uh, product table and the sales table that need to be joined, right? And we want the quantities of how many products are actually uh, uh, sold over the categories, are grouped by the categories. And then we do a second thing. We take the geo table and the sales table, and we want to say, well, um, how much did the, um, the stores actually sell, right, uh, in the different geographic locations, right? So grouped by the stores. These are two queries that both need joints of different dimensions to the fact table, right? The question is how do we speed them up, right? So, so, so what can we do? And of course one solution is um, we pre-compute the two joints that would be needed, product with cells and, and, and geolocation with cells, right? That would be rather big, right? It would be a materialization of, uh, uh, well, uh, basically a duplication of the fact table um, with different locations or with different products, right? Quite big. Um, we could compute the queries with um, all the selections that are made. Well, that, uh, that does only help us if we get the same query again, right? Or, or a sub-query of that, right? So if we have, okay, and this is uh, all the stores in Germany, and then somebody asks for all the stores in Bavaria, that's okay, that could be uh, answered uh, uh, using this materialized views. But if then somebody asks, and what about the stores in France? You would go like, okay, I have to do the join between the geo location and the fact table again, right? I mean, does not help. Um, or, you can use already materialized views if they are available. So uh, this is called query trimming. So um, what parts of materialized results can you actually um, uh, use or reuse? This is kind of kind of the idea. Okay, let's assume we have the following materialized view: um, total sales, which is basically a um, product between. The uh, product, uh, uh, um, the, 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 the product ID, geo IDs uh, from the sales tables. So this is a smaller version that has been joined um, by the um, product and the geo ID, um, and the sums of the quantities have been done. Right. The question is, can we use it in our two queries? Note that the first query only goes on the product. And the second query only goes on the geographical uh, location, right? If we done such a materialized view that includes both, a further restriction would allow us to answer both queries, right? Because there are no selections in the materialization. On the other hand, this is again a rather big materialization. Right? Because it's a join of the fact table with two dimension tables. End computation of the aggregate. <coughs> a lot of different um, values there. So,
this is kind of kind of the question that we have with all materialized views, right? What should we materialize? Uh, what what pays off in the end? So the issues with materialized views is, um, on one hand, the utilization. So which views will be used in future, right? So that we can decide to materialize them. Should we have indexes on them, right? Then we need a choice, right, of materialized views. Um, if we have a certain number of materialized views that we, we cater for, right, and given some query, can we actually use any of these views or a combination of these views to answer the query? And we need to talk about the maintenance of the view, right? So how expensive is it to update that view when something changes or when, when, when new data come in? Um, should we refresh it all the time or should we kind of rebuild the view um, kind of every week or once a month or something like that and say, well, we know it's a little stale, but it's okay. You know, like we, we, can, we can allow for this um, uh, 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 um, inconsistencies. Or is there actually a way of, of, of kind of refreshing it incrementally without touching the whole thing, right? So this is what we have to answer. Okay, let's go to the utilization first. The um, utilization of materialized views, of course, has to be transparent because all the queries that come into the system are rewritten to use either the base tables in the worst case or profit benefit from any materialized view that is available to answer the query, right? And uh, the uh, query rewriter just puts the uh, materialized view into the query execution graph, um, maybe together with, with some of the base dimension or selections of the base dimension, but uh, sometimes queries can be uh, completely answered on the, um, on the new view. So let's look up um, how it's work. Um, we have a monoblock query that kind of uh, works. So um, if I have a query that wants a join of the sales and the product table and wants to join it with the geo table, right, and then does something on it, and I have a materialized view that already joins the sale and the product table, then one can easily see that this block over here is exists, exists uh, uh, exactly this block over here, right? And this is called a monoblock query, right? In this case, the, um, uh, the um, query writer can immediately say, you know, original query, get rid of that and put the materialized view here, this is what you get, right? And there might be some selections coming down from here on this view, right? But basically, you skip the whole area here. You don't do that join on the base tables. You just do it with the materialized view. Clear? Yeah? No? Maybe? Hmm? Well, okay. Well, that's the easy part, of course, right? Because uh, our materialized view was fitting exactly um, into one of the query fragments that were needed by the query. Okay. So the integration of a materialized view needs to be um, a so-called valid replacement, right? Um, and any query represents a valid replacement of some other query. Um, if those queries always deliver the same result set, right, uh, under every possible data instance. So it's not dependent on the data instance uh, that you have on the extensional database uh, that you have, but uh, in, in, in all the cases, uh, they um, deliver the same result. Well, um, if, if 
you want to know whether two queries actually always deliver the same results. That's called entertainment, uh, basically. Um, you are facing an NP hard problem. So it's, it, it's not very easy to say whether um, Q prime is semantically equivalent to Q. I mean, you do have your relational algebra uh, uh, transformations that allow to, 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 to do some of these uh, uh, transformations. But basically, when two totally independent queries are given, they might or might not deliver the same result actually. Right? And finding that out is uh, an NP complete uh, uh, solution. But for some queries, uh, like, like star queries, for certain types of queries, uh, this problem can be broken down to some, some um, uh, special cases, right? Okay. If the following conditions are respected, we can guarantee that the exchange of base tables by a materialized view actually deliver the same result, right? So the first one is that the selection condition in the materialized view cannot be more restrictive than the one in the query. If I'm asking about the uh, sales in Europe, I cannot use a materialized view that only asks for or that only stores the sales in Germany. Unless I divide the query in, okay, Europe without Germany and this materialized view. So if I can put disjointly things together, that's okay, right? But asking a material adjoint whose selection condition is more restrictive than the query condition is a no-go. Okay, also the projection from the query has to be a subset of the projection from um, uh, the materialized view. The materialized view needs to be bigger in the attribute it features. Right? You can throw some out later on, but you can never retrieve some that were not in the materialized views in the first place. Um, it has to be possible to derive the aggregation functions that are used in the projections of the query from the materialized views. So if something has been um, aggregated on a uh, higher granularity level, right? you're not going to use that materialized view, right? because you're not getting the smaller granularity results. Once they have been aggregated, they are gone. Huh? And additional selection conditions in Q have to be possible also on M. So if you have a more restrictive view, throwing something out of the materialized view is always uh, possible. Uh, getting more than is in the materialized view is not possible, right? So these are conditions that need to be uh, met to guarantee that uh, the materialized view can actually be replaced. Okay, so how do you use the materialized view even when there is no perfect match? That's not a monoblock query, that's a so-called multi-block query, right? If the selection in the materialized view is more restrictive than the selection in Q, there's always the possibility to split the query in two parts, where one part is basically the selection condition that is the same as materialized view, and the other part is the complement, what is still missing. Right? So you're asking for something in your query and you have a materialized view that only covers a subset of that. Then you split, so if that is the scope of query Q, then you split, uh, uh, you split your query in two parts, QA, that only covers this part within the materialized view, right? that may actually use the materialized view to be executed. But then you need also query QB that covers the complement of the materialized view. That needs to be done on a different materialized view or on the base tables, right? Otherwise, you're running into problems. So. Do, 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 do. <coughs> Good. So uh, let's look at uh, how it actually works. We have our query again, and we have a materialized view. Um, 
that has some aggregations over here and over here on, on the fact table, right? Okay, and let's say we have uh, the selection in the query that is just all sales and uh, the query in the materialized view, the selection that we did is all sales above a certain threshold. So this one down here is more restrictive, right? So what do we do? Well, we basically tear the query apart. One uses the materialized view and supplants this block basically by the materialized view using both selection conditions, right? The other one still has to do this block because it cannot use the materialized view. So it does this block on the base tables as given in the original query, but using the complement of the um, different uh, 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 of the different uh, materialized view selection criteria, right? Those then need to be joined to the geo table, which is the part over here that does not occur in the materialized view at all. Okay? So-called multi-block query, one block using the materialized view down here, one block using the original table like they occurred in the query, right? Query splitting, predicate splitting. Yes? No? Maybe? Yes. Okay. Whee. Okay, so this is how you utilize the materialized views. Now the question is, of course, which materialized views um, do you want, right? So, um, a data warehouse is so powerful for um, uh, analytical qu queries because it pre-aggregates some of the data. Not all of the data usually, but some of the data. And of course, it would be very good if it pre-aggregates all of the data, right? Uh, then every query could be directly answered on materialized uh, issues. But the, 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 the problem is, you know, the more different dimensions you have, right? The more joins become possible. And it's, it's basically a lattice, right? You could aggregate uh, per all three, you could ag aggregate by any two pair, you could any aggregate by any individual pair, and you could aggregate everything into one big number, the so-called apex, right? Now consider it would be four. The lattice would grow. You con con could consider the four pair, right? You could consider all possible three pairs. You consider all the possible two pairs or the one pairs and so on, right? So this, this lattice grows and it grows ex actually exponentially, right? So it always doubles the possibilities the more dimensions you have, right? So if you have three dimensions, we already have eight, oops, we already have eight possibilities of materializations, right? If you have 16 dimensions, you have 65,000 possibilities of what different aggregations you can do, right, in this lattice. And it's growing, right? So um, as soon as it's more than five, six, seven dimensions, you cannot aggregate everything and store it in a materialized view. It will not work, right? It's, it's too expensive. So the question is, of course, what do you materialize, right? How do you know um, which things would be good to materialize and which can be left out and basically um, computed on demand? Good, so there are 
two possible ways of, of, of dealing with it. You can have a static choice and just say, okay, the database administrator is responsible for the database and he uh, assumes what indexes should be, so why not just letting him choose what um, a, um, uh, what materializations would be sensible. This is actually not so bad in terms of the idea because you have the query logs, you, you can look um, uh, in, in detailed level at what has been um, accessed right recently and, and then you make your decision and you organize uh, your data warehouse, right? Until the next um, check by the database administrator, those materialized views are the one to use and that's kind of like the thing. Um, that works very well if your mining or the uh, analytics you do on the data is of a uh, periodic kind. You know, like if you, if you basically ask the same reports again and again, you want the quarter sales um, every quarter, you know, like, and, and you want the aggregation of this and that every month or something like that, right? Then this works perfectly well. Um, if you are more more creative with the data, if you want to mine for new trends every five minutes, or um, uh, the management has a question, let's figure it out, let's get the data for it, right? Then what you need is a dynamical cho choice, yeah? Um, you, you, you try to figure out uh, what is happening or what will be happening in future. You're trying to be predictive and you're uh, supporting those materialized views uh, that, that you predicted. So let's look in detail into the different things. So the chat static choice is uh, the idea of the benefit that you know from historic queries. You see the query log, you see what has been used, and then you determine the benefit that each materialization would have had in that query load, right? And you usually take some cost function uh, where there are query costs, statistics, approximations. So what does it cost to use that materialized view as opposed to quickly computing it, right? Uh, so the more expensive something is to compute, the rather you would go for um, uh, uh, the, uh, the materialized view, right? Um, you take statistical approximations of the frequency of a query, frequently happening queries need to be supported by materialized views, and you look at the maintenance cost of a views, uh, so how expensive is it to keep that, that uh, view intact, right? So basically, the static choice is a knapsack problem, right? So you have a certain maximum storage size for materialized views, you have a certain budget uh, that you can assign, um, and then um, you, you, you know which, uh, from, from your query logs, you know which materialized views would have been nice to have, right? And you usually take a greedy approach. You say, okay, I know what I can store, what the possibilities are, and I have a cost function that shows me the benefit of each uh, view that goes into, into my budget, into my knapsack, right? And uh, then you put the first, the, the one promising the biggest benefit in first and do the same with the rest of the knapsack and at some point um, it's full, right? So this is typical um, greedy strategy. Um, greedy strategies are good, but there are some disadvantages. And one disadvantage is the manner that you're working with your, with your data warehouse. If your data warehouse is only used for reporting purposes, no problem whatsoever, do it, right? Just do the greedy knapsack, uh, static choice, you know, like it will be best choice ever, right? But if you're working with your data warehouse in an explorative manner, then the interactiveness of working with the data warehouse does not work for the materialized views. Then you would have to compute everything uh, from uh, uh, scratch, which is very annoying when you work online with something as opposed to waiting for a report a little bit longer or less, you know, like, I mean, um, the report is sent by email overnight or whatever, right? So uh, if it took an hour longer to compute the, uh, the report, that's not you know, like very annoying. But if you sit in front of the computer exploring data, what, okay, show me the trend, show me, show me a, a regression analysis, right? And you wait for five minutes. That's a bummer, right? That's not what you want to do. So this, this, this kind of interactiveness, that's difficult, right? 
Um, also, um, the query patterns might change, right? If it's not re really reporting, same thing again and again and again, Volkswagen type, right? Um, then you might have a problem with the static choice. Uh, so this is kind of difficult. Um, in any case, if you have some reporting, and you always will, uh, taking these materialized views and keeping them is a good idea in the end. Good. How about the dynamic choice of materialized views? Well, what you do is the same as in the static choice at first. You monitor the queries that are happening over time, right? And then you build a materialized view processing plan by incorporating the currently most frequently executed query, right? And this generation plan for the materialized view processing runs in the background and monitors everything that is going on, even what happens right now, right? And then whenever there's a chance where the, the uh, say, oh, this kind of view seems to be more, so there's, there's currently something going on uh, that, that needs this, this certain aggregations, right? Uh, that is very heavy on the geolocation or something like that, right? Very concerned with the geolocation. Then maybe on the fly materializing such a view, even if you throw other views out, is a good idea, right? And that leads to a reorganization of uh, the existence uh, of the existing views. Okay, how does it actually work? Well, it's kind of the same principle as caching, right? In a cache, you do the same thing. You have this cache hit ratio, you have this idea of uh, hot items that are in the cache and that are being kept in the cache. And whenever something new is, is um, uh, 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 loaded, you have to decide what to uh, push out of the cache to replace it by that new content, right? So the typical cache replacement strategy, right? Um, again, you need the benefit of uh, what happens, and the benefits for cache replacement are kind of like time of last access, so least recently used or something like that, the frequency of access, how big is it, so if it's small, maybe keeping it is a good idea. Um, if it's too big, should be thrown out. Um, cost of new calculation. So what does it cost me to restore it if somebody would need it? If that would be very expensive, I'd rather keep it. Uh, the number of queries that were already answered with that materialized views, um, number of queries that could be answered, whereas could be is kind of difficult to say, you know, like, or that you expect in near future to be answered, so prefetching and stuff like that comes into the game, right? So this is exactly the same um, problem as cache replacement like we have it in um, normal uh, databases or normal um, uh, uh, um, uh, operating systems, right? Okay, for the dynamic update of the cache, in each step you need to look at the benefit of a materialized view that is used or that could be used for answering that query. And you have to calculate it anyway to answer the query, right? So at the end, you have that materialized view, you have that query result, and you decide, store it in the cache or throw it out. Um, all the materialized views that you have, I mean, as soon as, as there's space in main memory, well, keep it. it. Might be good for something. It's only important if you hit the limit, the storage limit of your cache size, right, if, of, of the main memory that, uh, that, uh, that is available, right? And for that, you, you have a list of all the materialized views that are currently in the cache, and you have the benefit of all these materialized views, according to the factors that I just mentioned, right? And then when a new materialized view comes in, you fill the cache with a, materialized, with a new materialized view um, by pushing the lowest benefit materialized views out of the cache, right? And this is kind of the idea of dynamic choice. Good. 
Finally, the maintenance of materialized views. Right? Uh, this is a little problematic because um, the uh, materialized view, of course, is a version of underlying data. Whenever something in the underlying data change, you also have to change the materialized view, which is loading costs. Right? When you load something, you get an additional cost for also updating everything that has been materialized. Right? So the questions that you get is, how do you refresh a view with the underlying data? And when do you do it? Do you allow for stale views just to do it overnight, right? once a week or whatever? Or do you say, no, everything must be stable? Right? OK. How do you refresh materialized views? Well, um, basically, the easiest way and the most uh, current uh, and, 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 and best uh, uh, maintenance is every update in the base data is reflected in the materialized views. Right? You have the top-notch data warehouse. Everything is up-to-date. Everything is wonderful. Uh, on the other hand, you have very slow data warehouse. <laughs> And so this is usually not the best solution, right? Uh, usually, usually uh, what what should be done is incremental view maintenance. Um, so uh, incremental view uh, maintenance means um, that you that that from the changes of the materialized data uh, of the um, uh, underlying data, you compute what changes would result in the uh, materialized view and then update the view, right? Um, you can compute that, uh, the, the new view, basically as everything that is thrown out of the, um, of the, of the underlying data has in the aggregation been deconsidered in the view and everything that is inserted in the underlying data has to be added to the aggregations, right? Which is kind of difficult if you think about things like building averages, right? And now one thing is changed in the underlying data. One data item is changed, right? How does it affect the average? To what degree, right? You need to know how many tuples are there, and then you can, can, can kind of like look at the fraction that has changed now. But um, Sometimes for easy aggregations, this is possible for, for larger aggregation. This is, this is kind of stupid. Um, then there's the time, right? So how do you, uh, when do you do it, right? Um, one possibility is immediate, right? When the transaction, the, the, the loading, the ETL process actually changes the underlying data, also change all the materialized view, right? This is definitely needed for things like stock brokering or something like that, where, where you need all the information to be intact and to be online, right? Uh, for things like Volkswagen, well, one golf sold more or less doesn't, doesn't really make a difference, right? So um, the, the, the advantage, of course, you have always consistent materialized views. Nothing is stale. Disadvantage is very slow, right? Um, the deferred version is that uh, sometime later you 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 kind of do it, um, and this is kind of a, a clever idea because you if you have frequent update, if you have something like like uh, online warehousing, right, where you don't have this big loading bunch, right, bulk loading, and then you you also build the materialized views um, overnight, but you have smaller updates in the data, in the underlying data, then it might be good to collect some of these updates and then rebuild the materialized views with the collected, with the, with the aggregated uh, data. Um, the advantage is, of course, that it um, is, is, is much faster doing that, so you're not slowing down the updates. On the other hand, you have stale data. You have for, for, for a certain amount of time or a certain number of updates happening on the, on the base data, um, your materialized views does not show the reality, right? I mean, it's kind of difficult. So uh, the default comes actually in three flavors. Oops. There's uh, so-called lazy, um, default refresh, 
So um, before a new query on that materialized view is answered, it should be consistent again, right? So uh, basically an on-demand update of the materialized view. There's the periodic idea where you say, okay, every night, I, I, I just need the consistency of the data uh, up to the current week or something like that. So over the weekend, every time I rematerialize everything, then it's consistent again, right? And for the data of next week, I mean, I'm, uh, it, it just runs into the underlying data and does not affect the, the materialized view at all. So this is something that is there's very often done for, for data warehousing. So this overnight and over the weekend and between Christmas and New Year um, uh, mentality is typical for data warehousing uh, operators, right? So this is very, uh, this is what you see very often. Um, another idea is, is doing it event-based, so saying every five updates or every hundred updates on the base table, right, I will also um, uh, uh, work on the, on the materialized views. Okay? This is basically what materialized views are about. So what we talked about was basically how to change materialized views, what materialized views to select, and then materialized views should be refreshed, data staleness, data consistency. Good? Yep? Okay. Then let's sum up. <laughs> let's sum up. What we talked about today was first partitioning, horizontal partitioning, basically means the tuples are divided between different tables, between different partitions. Vertical partitionings, you take columns, you take different attributes in different areas. Um, both have their, their, their kind of like um, uh, uh, poss uh, possibilities and their, their chances. Um, a good idea are mini dimensions that are used for specific purposes like data mining or like uh, customer recommendation. We talked about joins. Um, data warehousing needs different join order optimizations than the classical databases. We talked about star joins, uh, which is a special case where dimension tables are aggregated first. And we talked about um, cross product joins with indexes, um, which is if you have multiple um, uh, um, join dimensions or uh, large cardinality dimensions, a very good idea to work on the indexes expect, uh, um, uh, instead of the, the, the actual data. And we talked about materialized views. The bad news is we, we usually can't materialize everything due to storage reasons, but also due to the maintenance cost that this would occur. Um, so uh, we have to select what to materialize. Basically, it's either a static knapsack problem or it's kind of like the cache replacement um, uh, 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 idea. Strategies are exactly the same as in the cache replacement. You always have cost functions, you have benefit functions, and you throw out the thing with the lowest benefit um, and take in the stuff with higher costs. Right? The benefit uh, cost function is decisive. Right? If you have a good one, it works. If you have a bad one, it does not work. Cool? Yes. yes, exactly. Next time, we will talk about queries. We will actually build the data warehouse and go into online analytical processing, look it up, uh, how, it, how it works with um, uh, different warehousing. We will talk about SQL. We will talk about MDX, which is a special uh, dialect for, for data warehousing queries that uh, you will find out there. And um, that's all for now, folks. Thanks for the attention. <laughs>